here on a big game day for the Minnesota Wild. And we are joined today, the Russo Suhan Unfiltered Podcast by Wild owner Craig Leopold and uh, his like eighteen bodyguards and his <laughs> his uh, all the supermodels. I would be concerned <laughs> if Steve was my bodyguard, yeah. Craig. Hey, is it the Russo Suhan podcast or the Suhan Russo podcast? Suhan well, Russo. the the overall show was called Suhan Unfiltered at SuhanUnfiltered dot com. But I think when it's Russo and I doing it together, I call it Russo Suhan because we know Mike just couldn't handle being yeah. second in that sentence. It would really I bother I don't him. Let him. Speak. I get and it. I totally understand thing. that. I and totally once understand. I introduce both of you, I'm going to go run some errands because I'm not going to get another <laughs> chance to speak anyway. <laughs> oh, we'll let you ask a couple good questions. So, I appreciate so, it. In, in honesty, though, Steve being your bodyguard isn't yeah. that a little concerning? To you, like, well, the fact that he's going to have knee surgery pretty soon, yeah, and yeah, I, he keeps a bullet in his top pocket right here. I, I haven't, I have not seen him for the last year where he hasn't been on crutches for I some know, reason. So I, know. I mean, he's, I, he's I not well. He's not he, well. <laughs> Are you blaming I, Craig for that? I'm just hard saying, on your you points, know, Craig. <laughs> he does know every one of Craig's secrets. I think when Craig gets out of line, he like warns Steve. Uh, yeah, he Steve, owns we got to talk later. He owns me. <laughs> it is. It is uh, game three of the second round of the Stanley Cup playoffs. Wild lose two in Chicago. Back home tonight. Uh, we'll be doing another podcast from the Liffey on Thursday at three thirty with Tracy Myers from uh, CSN Chicago to talk about the Blackhawks. Give us the state of your stomach, Craig. How are you feeling? Well, I'm feeling like I've had a couple pizzas and sausages, and uh, uh, it's a little tight right now. Um, you know, we obviously we wish we were in a different position, but they won. Chicago won their first two games at home. Now it's our turn to bring it back here and see how we can play at home, and we're pretty confident. And our fans, as you guys well know, you know they are such a difference maker, particularly in the playoffs. Just how they can really get our team excited. Now, I sat with you uh, during a preseason game. You were fired up for the preseason game. How, just how exponential is your uh, emotional catharsis during the playoffs? <laughs> Those are awful big words to uh, use I just, me I when just, you're asking that kind of question. Thing. But I think what you're asking is – And I, honestly, I don't understand what I said either. So. <laughs> Imagine what the – play. You're, yeah, I mean, the like playoffs that. is just – is uh is like a different world and everything the everything's heightened the stress level is higher the you know the fun level is also higher uh you know it's just i can't wait for the puck to drop and get this thing going and you know this is the hard time right now is waiting for the is waiting for the puck to drop one more bit of promotion uh guinness is a major sponsor and we are giving away a free guinness to the first 50 people who show up and retweet or favorite, favorite us on Facebook, anything, any kind of social media uh, w- recognition. We'll get you a free Guinness. Again, we'll be doing it again Thursday at 3.30. Michael, well, I, I just I'm would, turning you loose. Yeah, I just can't imagine that you uh, expected that you'd be down 0-2. You know, I mean, this is – I can only imagine the amount of years off your life this team is taking you down 0-2 <laughs> for the fourth time in five series. Uh, we're we're this, used to being down 0-2. Yeah, I know. Uh, so it, we're not strangers to this. Um, we know that we're going to you know, have to fight back. Uh, we, our feeling is we're going to win our home games, and we have to win one of four games on the road. And uh, now it's one of two games. And, you know, the only good news that I can certainly look back at, and I think all of our fans can understand, is, you know, we've had our back against the wall now for two and a half months. And so we're not strangers to having to fight hard and get in this thing and, and you know, do, you know, do things that are unusual, winning seven games on the road, 13 games on the road. So, uh, you know, we're hoping that we can we can do that again. And I think. You know, it all starts with tonight's one game at a time. It starts with tonight's game. And if we win it, we're back. You know, in January, uh, I remember Michael and I were covering one of your games and it was a really ugly loss. You guys were buried in the standings. And I remember saying and talking to other people and writing that, hey, you know, don't try to save this season. You guys are done. Did you ever adopt that mindset? Because my, my philosophy was at that point, OK, it doesn't look like you're going anywhere this year. Just have a year where you actually get a high draft pick and, and try to bring in some more talent. Obviously, you're, you ended up not going that route, but did you come close? Uh, I'd say yes, we came close. Uh, we were probably within a within a couple games of being sellers at the at the trade deadline versus buyers. Um, uh, yeah, we were Chuck and I were talking a number of times of you know what direction should we go? Should we? And, and we just kind of kept waiting, and then all of a sudden, Devin Dubnik became available, and obviously everything changed. And Chuck made that call. It, it was, uh, you know, it was a it was a very iconic time for us. And uh, 
you know, it changed everything. But you're right. I got to tell you, mid January was uh, was not fun to be around me and and our players and our anybody in our office. It just was not a good time. What was your reaction when uh, you found out that you guys were acquiring Devin Dubnik? You you, you couldn't have known uh, one that he would be able to do this. But how much did you even know about Devin? Uh, we knew that he was six six. Mm-hmm. Uh, we like that. <laughs> Um, uh, you know, Bob Mason liked him, you know, and, and he had seen him play, uh, you know, and, and he liked it. He liked the way that, that he played. His record was actually pretty good in, in Phoenix. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I, you know, Chuck was, hey, you know, this guy is, you know, he's good. It's, you know, it's, it's unbelievably low cost of what he was in, in what they were paying him in Phoenix. So let's bring him in, see what he can do for us. And, you know, you know, we all know how the story played out, and it's just it's been a you know a great move for him, and a great move for us. The uh, playoffs, these eight thirty starts. A lot of people have asked us about. Now I understand why they exist. All right, it did, first of all, it does seem like only the central time zone has to play mm-hmm. these games. I understand that it's so the league could try to get every single game on television, but when you have a game like say game one in Chicago where because of the Montreal-Tampa game goes to double overtime, that the country can't watch your game anyway. Does it make any sense to you that, that you guys are forced to play an 830 game when they have no backup contingency plan to begin with on a, in a league where all likelihood a game is going to go long before yours? I, I hate 830 games. I hate them with a passion. Our players hate them. The hockey ops hates them. It doesn't do anything for us. Uh, but it does a lot for the NHL, and you know they want to get all as many games as they can on on NBC. Uh, and you're right; we're the only ones who are hurt. If you're in the Central Time Zone, you know the Eastern Time Zone, they get to start their games at six o'clock or seven, usually seven o'clock, the normal time. Western Time Zones at nine thirty, their normal time. So we're the ones who have to adjust, and it, it's a hardship that we that we are stuck with at least through the second round once we get to the once we get to the third round there's my confidence level mm-hmm. uh, we won't have to worry about that because there will just only be two games you know going every on other night. yeah every other night so we're going to be we'll, we'll be in fine shape but how, how much i mean have you talked to the league about this and you know in particular if they're going to have these 830 starts then why not have games on you know potentially your game at least be on CNBC if another game goes goes long or something like that. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. I have not spoken to the league about this. Chuck mm-hmm. has, mm-hmm. Um, and it, it's kind of a hockey ops deal, you know. And I'm going to let the you know the whole playoffs kind of play out. And uh, I plan to talk, ask Gary Bettman about it, and what can we do? So first of all, the 8:30 games is what I don't like, and I agree. If there is a, an overtime that conflicts with our our uh, start time, then we should be on a different channel. Our mm-hmm. fans want to see the see the whole game. You know, Bettman tends to, at least in my eyes, not come across real well when he's in public, when he's a public speaker. Uh, I've talked to him myself. I'm not sure I ever really quite believe what I'm hearing. But I think you and I have had a conversation where you were pretty positive about the guy. Give me your take on Batman. Well, he's um, uh, he's older than I am because he was born on June second and I'm <laughs> June third, so of the same year. Uh, and so I've got a lot of respect for his experience and maturity. Uh, <laughs> seriously, okay, the, uh, the guy honestly he doesn't get credit for the things that he has done for the game. And everybody likes to call him a basketball guy, and he was never a bat. Sure, he worked for the NBA, but he was always, uh, even at Cornell, he was always a huge hockey fanatic. So I mean, he loves the game. He's done so much for the game, a lot for um, the franchises and the rules of the game and the fans. It's more exciting, and they're, we're constantly trying to figure out, you know, and you know, work on ways to make the game better for our fans and better for TV. And uh, and that's one reason that franchise values are up, that payroll is way up with players, um, you know, and so that's what he's been trying to do. And he doesn't get a lot of credit for that. And he should. The game is better. I will say that uh, there was a time when I did not like watching NHL games, especially NHL regular season games, clutching, grabbing, yep. Uh, yep. you know, excessive neutral zone trapping. Everybody's trying to win one nothing. Now you watch really good defensive teams play against each other, and the score still might be four to two or five to three because players can move. So.
agree with that. And there was a time, you know, that that uh, you know, if you were ahead one to nothing in the third period, or if yeah. you were up anything in the third period, you were not going to win the game because the defense was going to pull you back, was going to hold you, and, and they were getting away with it. And it wasn't a whole lot of fun watching that. And and that was changed in like oh three oh four, and I think the whole dynamics of the game changed with it. When you uh, look at this series now, granted it is far from over, but when you see the Blackhawks and their stars um, like Kane and Taves and, and some of these guys uh, you know, continue to be as dominant as they are, does it, does it give you concern that, at, at just that this is the team that you're going to have to go on forever, uh, go up against forever, and yet you know, you're never, because of the fact that you've never bottomed out, you've never been able to draft core players like them. I mean, you look at Kane, he's 26, Taves, 28. These guys are going nowhere. So this is a team that you are going to have to fight against forever. You, that's exactly right. And we we recognize that. We talk about it. Um, you know, we're not going to knee jerk and we're, and we're not at all feeling like like we are not going to win this series. We think we're going to. We, we believe they've won their first two games at home. We now have to play our style hockey. We're going to be able to match up the matchups, the lines that we want to have. And uh, our hope is, is that that will change as it as it really did last year. When we were in the playoffs. You know, we we play better at home. We can particularly against Chicago. Uh, we can match up better with them when we're deciding who's going to be on the, the, the uh, Taves line. And uh, you'll probably see, uh, as, we, as we had last year, we'll probably have Koivu will be mm-hmm. the matchup on that line. And he did a great job last year shutting him down. I give you guys credit. You've pulled out all the stops. You needed a home victory in uh, the first round, and Mike Yo know, gets everybody to drink Bloody Marys. And then yeah. <laughs> now tonight, you know, this morning, power outage, you know, slow down the ice, uh, melt, melt some ice, slow Patrick Kane down. It's pretty good management, I'd say. <laughs> Everything is fine over there right now. It's the, the the power outage has affected the wild offices. Our our power is off, but uh, it's still off. We, huh? Yeah, it's still off. Wow. It's yeah, amazing. yeah. But the arena is fine. You know, we've heard from our players at practice that the ice is great. So yeah, we're it was. I, I just left the arena. You would not even believe how cold it is in there. I know. It it is, everybody it is, bring their sweaters. It and is. We, uh, we're taking no chances. I mean, it is. It's like the second everybody left the morning skates, they just dial it down to like five degrees. It is frigid. Yeah, um, it was right. an interesting morning skates today because they didn't – because of, you know, when they arrived at the arena, the way I understand it is that it was basically a puddle. And they had – so they froze it. And then they but, – but because it was it was lower than normal, they had to do dry scrapes before each each skate. So it got pretty low. And now they've, they've really flooded the thing and now are uh, really trying yeah, to freeze I, you know, it. I, I know that there were some issues uh, early on before 9, like 8.30 – but by the time 9.30 rolled around, we had everything really back up operating. And, uh, you know, the practices went off on time at 10.30, and everybody said the, the ice was really good. Preecy said it was excellent. So yeah. if he one likes of the, it, we like it. Absolutely. Uh, one of the first podcasts I did was with you in your office, and you mm-hmm. told some great stories about uh, – about Nashville and Vince Gill thro- helicoptering is uh, six iron over your head. Uh, so, oh, yeah. it, listen, it worked out very well for you to play St. Louis first round. But did in your heart, did you want to go back to Nashville? Uh, Jim, honestly, I was I wasn't really sure who I wanted to play, but I was really glad it at the time when before we even had our first game and we realized it was St. Louis. I was happy it was St. Louis. And I just I felt uh, we had a good chance against against St. Louis. Nashville has a goaltender that can win a series all by itself, and uh, and and I didn't really want to go up against Pekka Rene, and and I thought that we could, you know, our speed was going to be more important than their size, and I think it was, and it worked out, it worked out well. I will also tell you, Nashville's a great place to go visit. You guys know that, uh, and it's a lot of fun and. Um, but uh, I think I think our uh, the uh, the first round opponent was was the right one. Uh, one of our friends of the program, one of the friends of the podcast, Eyes on Vandy, t- actually t- uh, sent in a question on Twitter. Said, besides Predator games, what was your favorite thing to do or favorite place in Nashville? Uh, favorite thing to you know there was a, there was a hockey tonk bar called Wolfie's. And it was where everybody would go. Uh, our office guys would go there and, you know, after work. And it was just, you know, this guy loved hockey and he was a real country music 
buff and it was right beside the arena and so we would usually hang out there an awful lot it was just a fun place to go they'd have live music at night and uh you know just to go up and down broadway to be honest with you all the live music that goes on is is a fun thing and i was not a country music fan when i first started but i came to appreciate it how uh, just proud are you of what that city has become in terms of a hockey uh, hotbed? I mean, it really is. You you go, you see the fans, the way that they pre-party down there, and yeah. and the, and the way they have packed that arena up uh, and and brought just a lot of excitement to those games. You know, that's something that just didn't exist even five six years ago. Yeah, it is. Uh, I mean, Nashville has clearly turned into a, a you know a place to watch great hockey. Fans are great. They always were great. They always were. They're passionate hockey people in in Nashville, and it was always fun to go to the games. And you know, the star power that would that would show up was always you know kind of a a big plus. And uh, it's uh, it, it's it's a great city. I, I I really miss not going to Nashville. Having said that, say, you know this city, the dynamics, the culture, the heritage of the game is completely different than it is down there um and uh i i enjoyed a whole lot more here this postseason uh it's been almost impossible to get into the arena uh if you're a wild fan i mean it is uh, you know this is the first time that you've ever had this issue right i mean in terms of uh just this being the ticket to get in the city and uh, i'm sure your sponsorships are going well and everything uh the excitement yeah. around there uh, how excited it's are you it's unbelievable it mm. it just you know we meet uh well, we we have a, a big staff meeting every uh every week and we all get together at nine o'clock and and go over all the results of what's happening and ticket sales and sponsorship group sales and you know everything is uh is is up and up and up sold out sold out sold out you know, we didn't have that uh, four years ago, three years ago, where we were looking at, you know, some major business issues that we no longer have. We, you know, we feel like, you know, the, the, um, the our fans are uh, appreciative of what we've done. They, they understand our commitment. We're committed to winning. We're committed to great entertainment. Uh, we've got some great employees that, that know how to put the whole experience together in the package and, and this is a great community, and, and I think that they understand that we're playing hockey for one reason, and we want to bring the cup to town. Have you heard about Russo's slacks? I've heard. You know, my dad talks about slacks. My dad talked about slacks. <laughs> I, had, I, had not heard the, I had not heard the word until a couple of podcasts ago, and Michael started talking about his slacks, and I thought, oh, uh, I, I thought we have to keep bringing this up, and now there is a Russo slacks on Twitter that follows us. <laughs> Hashtag I just, Russo slacks. I just yeah. brought this up to embarrass Michael. I don't really have a question, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, seriously. Uh, Craig knows me well enough to know that I, uh, you know, I'm you're a sharp dresser. Yeah, sharp yes. dresser. Yes, I, I give him that. credit. He sharp kicks dresser. my butt in that category. Yeah. Sharp dresser. How much do you, uh, you know, there are so many owners that aren't accessible to the media. You know, I mean, there. I, I was talking to a. Beat you writer. stole my question. Yeah, I mean, I, I was talking to a beat writer about this in uh, St. Louis the other day, who you know well. Um, you know, you've you've run into him on occasion. I think one occasion, yeah, one occasion. <laughs> um, but you know, there are so many. I mean, heck, uh, there are some beat writers that can't even get their GM to talk. Um, yeah, uh, you know, f why why are you as accessible as you are? I mean, you know, people. Uh, I mean, fans even can get in touch with you. You know, wh why is that? Uh, well, that's an interesting question. I'm. Uh, you know, we, we we have a message that we need to get out, all right? And, you know, the message is that, you know, we're selling our team. We're selling our product. We, we've got, you know, something that we need to sell. The media helps us sell that, uh, and we're selling to our fans. And, you know, it's not just during, you know, bad times when we need airtime and talk about our messaging and things like that but in good times and now we can talk about the good things that are happening and you know i'm not you know i guess personally i'm not intimidated by uh you know you guys even russo I, I, well russo intimidates yeah, me i i have to agree <laughs> with that but you know this is a, you know this is a fun thing to do i mean why not I, you know this is i love sitting down talking to people and you know i'm not worried that i'm going to say although i have said things that i shouldn't have and i what? agree tell us oh no i, I remember <laughs> occasionally gary bettman calling me the next day you did what you said what 
But can, can uh, I ask you about? And if you don't want to talk about this, but this is something you know. I mean, during the lockout, right? Yeah, I mean, the that lockout was, was always. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I shouldn't be talking during the lockout. Yeah, uh, but it also, I mean, you pretty much got booted from the room, right? In November, I mean, you stopped going to the meetings after. Uh, after. Uh, well, that wasn't because of anything I said to, that the, was, pop, to the media. It was a disagreement <laughs> with that a player. I, right? that I had with uh, with a player. Yeah, <laughs> and. Uh, um, yeah, we'll leave that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, let's, let's go big picture here. When you, by the way, that player never played again. I don't want to. I don't want to. I didn't want to say wanna, anything. Yeah, he never played another NHL game. And his name is. What was that guy's name? It was. Uh, I can't remember. Played for Columbus. Uh, I'll look it up. You'll think of it, and when you do, <laughs> tell us. Uh, he ended with go, the Blackhawks, but. To go yeah. uh, big picture here, when you've had a chance to hire somebody key, general manager or coach, you haven't have gone the safe route. You have, there, I mean, there are so many quality retreads in the NHL. There's always a good coach or a good GM sitting out waiting for his next job, uh, and you've kind of taken the road less traveled. Is that philosophical, or was it just in each case you saw something in the individual that, that brought you that way? Uh, I, th- I think it's a, it's a case-by-case situation, and – you know, the only hires that I've really ever done in 17 years was that I was responsible for hiring was David Poyle in Nashville, and he's still there as a general manager, and Chuck Fletcher here. So I've really hired two guys, and I, I, I've given input on coaches and things, but you know that was not my decision and it was you know other people were accountable for that so you know uh you know i don't i think the key is in any big decision like that just don't knee jerk you know you don't when things you know i i'm sh- i know you're gonna have a follow-up question about was you know in january was mike yo job was mike's job on russo's the line? gonna ask that i, was gonna I know he's gonna ask that yeah and, and honestly, it never was. There was never even a conversation. We, Chuck and I never, ever talked about the possibility because I don't think he ever thought about it. And I can honestly assure you, it never crossed my mind. So, so that one, you know, you know, obviously never happened. And certainly we're glad it didn't. But, you know, when you're, when you're hiring someone like a general manager, it is a big, big decision because it, it affects everything from the top all the way down to the bottom, all your players, everything. And you, you need to get someone that, that you're compatible with, that has the same goals and aspirations that you do, that's passionate about winning. And, and um, you know, everybody knew Chuck was, uh, uh, you know, was a great business person in hockey. And um, so he had that, obviously. That was a no-brainer. But the best part of our relationship, I think, is that we just get along really well. And and especially with a GM, too. Like, GMs, you want to be a long-term decision. You know, I mean, coaches, look, they're, you know, it's sad, but they're hired to be fired eventually. But if you have a GM that you're firing every four years, your organization is going to go to absolute You're in real trouble because that means you need a new coach, and the new new coach wants to bring in his own assistants, and and then they have a different strategy of how they want to play the game, and and lines change. And it really, I mean, when you change a coach, you're changing – you know, a lot. It's the same thing with the general manager. I mean,
Averick did. May, same experience level. Is this the guy that you think can take us to the next level? Because there's going to be a lot of pressure on you if it doesn't work. Right. And, um, you know, to.
contract puts the coach in a position where he almost has to defer.
mm -hmm. you know, a town that used to shut down at four.